today you are the warriors. You got up early. Who needs an extra hour of sleep anyway? False. We all need an extra hour of sleep. But I'm proud of you for being here today. And I talk with the Lord and you get an extra crown in heaven for this today. So God bless and congratulations. Uh, but I'm glad you're here today. We're beginning something brand new. And uh, as you heard uh, Pastor Steve say just a moment ago, a brand new series that we're calling Rooted. And uh, it's all about the fruit or fruits of the Spirit that's found in Galatians chapter 5. That's where we're going to be camped out for the duration of this series. But before we get there, if you're new to faith, you're braving the, just sacrificing the hour of sleep today, you're here, we just want to say welcome home. It's great to have you with us this morning. My name's Pat. I'm the campus pastor here, and uh, it's a joy to have you along with everybody else that calls this place home on a regular basis. Great to have you here today, and uh, we're going to have uh, just a, a great time as we uh, share scripture today and hopefully learn and glean some new things uh, from it. You know, and at our church, uh, we desire to do this in everything that we do. We desire to build communities of people, like groups of people that uh, love God and love people and move our faith forward. And everything we do, that's, that's what's our aim, is that we build people that love God and love people. And we believe that loving God and loving people is more than just attending church. Now, I'll say, Attending church is important, but loving God and loving people extends beyond attending church on a Sunday. It's about meeting people where we are, and I think the degree to which we really love and trust God will be shown in the degree that we really love the people around us, and it's about meeting people's needs where we are, and I want to say yesterday we had an opportunity uh, to do that together. Yesterday we were blessed to go and serve some people in our community uh, by doing some yard work, cutting down some brush, uh, doing some different things, uh, being a little dangerous with ladders and pole saws, but we made it. We survived, and all limbs except trees were uh, salvaged, which is okay, but we helped a, a family that was on disability, uh, a, an older widow that lost her husband back in September. We were able to go to her house and uh, just give them some help. Also, we had uh, someone deliver uh, from our campus across the great state of Pell City uh, like 200 boxes of food yesterday, which was absolutely amazing. And it was just such a powerful, powerful day. And these things are called Servolution. It's an opportunity for us to gather together corporately as a group and go out and serve in our community. Now, here's the issue. We only do this four times a year collectively as an event together. But what I want to say is this is something that we desire not just to happen four times a year. We need to be a people that are serving always Whenever there is a need, we rise up and we meet the need. And so I want to give you permission today. You don't need us to design an event for you to get some people that go to church here and go meet the needs of someone in our community. I like Just go do it. Like, you don't have to tell me. You don't have to take pictures. You don't have to attach our name to it. I don't really care. I just want people's needs met, and that's why we are gathered together. And so listen, go and do that thing. And listen, if you, if you need a little help, you know somebody that has uh, a need, uh, we have this incredible, incredible way that you can share that with us, right? You can just text the word need to this number. You can take a picture of that, put that number in your phone, whatever you want to do, and we'll try to rally some people together to help meet that need because we think that really is the heart and the essence of what the church should be and should be doing, right? And so we had a great time yesterday, and man, I would just love to hear stories just out of the blue of people that are doing things that I don't even know about. That would just be the greatest thing. And so uh, it's so excited about kind of what's stirred up amongst us. And so let's continue to do that. Again, if you have a need, share that with us and uh, we'll do our best because I know this, at our church, we just got some great people, right? Other churches have good people. We got great people. So we'll make it happen and uh, excited about that. So let's get started today. And so uh, this series, Rooted, it's going to take off from a point, going to jump off from a point that we actually made last week in the final week of our relationship series. And uh, we're going to jump off from that point into today. And here's the point we made last week that I want to remind you of, and it's this. We talked about that in our relationships, the power of the Holy Spirit makes all 
of the difference. The power of the Holy Spirit makes all of the difference. What do I mean by the power of the Holy Spirit makes all of the difference? Here's what I'm saying. We said this in all of the different kinds of relationships we have. How do I honor and love my boss or my coworker when that boss or coworker is mean to me or is unfair to me or treats me in a way that's not the best way? How do I still honor that person? How do I still honor and love and serve my spouse when they make me angry or they get on my nerves a little bit, right? How do I still honor that person on the other side of me? How do I honor my parents, right? When I feel like my parents are being unfair to me and are being a little mean to me about some things and taking some things way too soon, how do I still honor and love and serve those people? And I want to say, this is how the power of the Holy Spirit makes all of the difference. And here's what I mean by that, is that when we naturally, our natural response to someone that is unfair to us or mean to us is we want to strike back, right? Well, maybe not you people, second service people. We want to strike back at them, right? We want to get back. We want to get even, right? We want to defend ourselves and rise up, right? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of things. Like the natural response is to strike back. But the beauty of the power of the Holy Spirit is that he reminds us and guides us and speaks to us and helps us to see there is a better way. Rather than striking back, there is a better way. And he reminds us and brings us back to the way of Jesus, which is to love others in the way that he has loved us. The Holy Spirit brings to mind to us and teaches us there is a better way, there is a better perspective. So the power of the Holy Spirit really does make all of the difference. And so what you saw roll across in the sermon intro just a moment ago, those words, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those nine things are referred to as the fruit of of the Spirit. How many of you have ever heard of those before, right? The fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to be breaking down those nine fruits. Now, here's a question a little word problem today. If we have three weeks to complete this series, we have nine fruits to cover. How many fruits are we going to cover per week? <laughs> Good guess. That would be my answer too. Three, right? And so look, math works outside of the classroom. My wife is happy as a math teacher this morning, right? You just solved a word problem on Daylight Savings Day Sunday, right? So I'm very proud of you for that. So we're going to cover three fruits per week of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to say something about this series that, um, or about the fruits of the Spirit that I'm going to say often as I tend to repeat important things over and over, I, I'm going to repeat this a few times during the series. And so let's go ahead and get it out of the way first and foremost, because I think it's important for us to remember uh, about the fruit of the Spirit. And I think it will help us think of it, I think, in terms uh, of a little bit more of a healthy way to understand it. And so I'll say this about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is not a to-do list. It's not a to-do list. The fruit of the Spirit is a results list. The fruit of the Spirit is not a to-do list. The fruit of the Spirit is a results list. These fruits, these characteristics, it's not necessarily something that we do, although we will do it, but really it grows off of our lives as the result of us spending time and being surrendered to, to the Holy Spirit of God. It is the fruits of the what? The Spirit. So it is the Spirit's job to grow these in our lives. And so our only job is to surrender to and trust and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as we do that, the result is those nine things begin to grow off of our lives, right? And so we're, we're not going to go out and just conjure up and do peace or patience. We're going to trust the leading of the Spirit and live a life according to the Spirit, following the way of Jesus. And when we do that, these characteristics naturally just begin to grow in us. And when they grow in us, then they begin to come out of us towards other people. So it's important that we understand this is not a to-do list it is a results list, the result of a life lived in the Spirit. And so that's the way I want you to think about the fruits of the Spirit, these characteristics. And so I want to ask you the question, are these fruits or is this fruit growing in your life? Are you loving? Are you joyful? Are you peaceable? 
Are you patient? Are you kind? Are you good? And good not in the sense that you get it right every time. That's not what it's saying. But, 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 but are you good natured towards others? Are you faithful? Are you gentle? Do you exhibit self-control? Are these fruits growing off the tree of your life? And what I love about these fruits, the fruit of the Spirit, and what's really great about it is it really gives us a way to evaluate where we are with God. It really is a good evaluation tool for us to take a step back and say, where am I really in my trust, dependency, and my reliance on the Spirit of God? Because if these things are present in my life, it's proof that I'm rooted in the right soil. But if these things really aren't that present, aren't coming out of me in my life, then it tells us we're rooted in the wrong things. And so this is a really, really, really good evaluation tool. God gives us a tool, the fruit of the Spirit, to evaluate our growth. And so how well are we really loving others? Are we loving others the way that Jesus has loved us? Are we patient with others? It's, it's impossible to love others the way Jesus loves us if we're not kind to people, right? If we're not loving towards others, if we're not patient with people. And so these fruits are critical critical to doing the way of Jesus. And so let's see where our lives are rooted. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 5, and as we begin, we're going to go back a little bit from verse 22, which tells us the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to start in verse 16 uh, in just a moment, but what you're going to see kind of um, juxtaposed in contrast to one another, you're going to see the characteristics of the sinful nature on one side, and then you're going to get the fruit of the Spirit on the other, and they're kind of contrasted against one another. And so we're, we're going to look at both of those, and both of those are going to tell us where we really are rooted in our lives. And so let's pay attention. It's important. In Galatians 5, 16, Paul tells us something very important, makes a very declarative statement, and he says, so I say, very declarative, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. It's imperative. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Why? Here's why. Because when the Holy Spirit guides your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And so right off the bat, we understand there is something in us that craves something a little different than what the Spirit of God craves. And so we must be yielded not to ourselves, but rather to the Spirit of God. So I say, let the Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Let your lives be guided by the Spirit. When we are torn between the two natures, between the Spirit and our sinful nature, when we are going back and forth between both of those often, we really aren't free. And we're really not living in the freedom that Jesus has won for us through the cross and through his resurrection over the power of sin and death. We cannot live in the Spirit one day and then live according to the sinful nature the next six days and expect to be free and expect to walk in victory. It is impossible because when we go back and forth between the two natures, we're tied up. We're constantly fighting back and forth and we're not living in freedom. We're not experiencing the full power of the gospel that's given to us in Jesus. And what is the gospel? Here's a working definition of the gospel that I absolutely love. I did not make it up. I read it somewhere, but I absolutely love this definition of the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God's kingdom has come near in Jesus Christ and through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, the powers of sin and death no longer have the last word over us. That's good news. Like That's the power of the gospel. What Jesus has done has the last word, not sin and death, right? And so if we want to experience power and victory and walk in freedom, we must live a life led by the Holy Spirit and not led by our sinful nature, craving the things of the sinful nature. And so Paul tells us, I say, let the Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing 
what the sinful nature craves. Here's a million dollar question. I can tell it's on your face. You're asking, what does my sinful nature crave? It's a great question that you're asking because we get the answer in verse 19. It says this, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry. Idolatry is believing something other than the way of Jesus is going to bring us life and fulfillment. It's idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, or hostility, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I don't know what and the like is after orgies, but hey, there you go. That's kind of crazy. I'm sorry I just said that out loud, but Scripture said it first, so that's, that's on Scripture, not on me, Right? And the like, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this, this is so important, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we want to experience life to the full, if we truly want to walk in the kingdom of God and experience life, and not just experience for ourselves, but the people around us find this beautiful life that's found in following the way of Jesus, it will be an impossibility for us if we are hung up in this. If we are going back and forth between the two natures, we need to make a move, right? It's impossible to be controlled or driven by these things and then turn and love others the way that Jesus has loved us. It will be impossible because when we are driven by these things, we look at people not as how can I serve you, but we look at people as how can you serve me? How can you please my needs? How can you meet my needs? How can I take from you to please myself? That's the way we'll look at others when we're filled with that, when we crave that, which is actually the opposite way of Jesus. And so God is saying this, that that if those things are growing off of the tree of my life, then it tells us we're not rooted in the right soil. We're not even in the right garden. We're in the wrong kingdom, and we're trusting the wrong things to bring us life. This is a great first step of evaluation. Ask yourself, do these things dominate your life? Not do these things pop into your mind. It's not a sin for this stuff to pop into your mind. It happens. We're human beings with minds that are free to think and wonder. But what do we do with these thoughts? Do we act on them? Do we hang on to them? What what do we do with them? Do we look to these things for fulfillment and life as opposed to the way of Jesus? And if we are rooted in this, I want to say here's what needs to happen today. We need to repent. Now repent just very simply means this. We need to turn to a better way. That's what it means to repent. I'm gonna turn to a better way. And by, it's, it's a positive thing. When I turn to a better way, naturally and logically, I'm turning away from the other way, right? We need to turn to a better way. So if we are rooted in this, we can't follow the way of Jesus. We truly can't love others the way he has loved us. So we need to turn to a better way. So we must let the spirit guide our lives so we don't do the things a sinful nature desires, Right? We must allow the Spirit to lead us. What does it look like as the Spirit's leading and filling our lives? It says this in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. And think about how different this is from what we just read about the sinful nature. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And now here's quite possibly my favorite part of the scripture. Against such things, there is no law. There is no limit to the excess to which we can experience those things. There's no limit to the extent that we can experience those things. I love that so much. That when the spirit leads and guides our lives, we can be filled to overflowing. And that overflow isn't just for us, but it bleeds out into the people around us. So I say, let the Spirit guide your lives. So let's look at the first fruit today, first of three. The first fruit is this. The first is love, love. How many of you would agree that we talk a lot about love here? All right, we do, and we should, right? 
The first fruit is love. Love is key, and it's interesting to me that love is the first fruit. It's first because it is the most important. It is the most essential. If our lives and the things that we do, if it doesn't begin with and end with love, everything in between is going to be messed up. And so love is the first fruit, and it's absolutely essential. Love is a fruit that must, that must, that must grow off of the tree of our lives as followers of Jesus, period. The love of God is the lifeblood of every follower of Jesus. The love of God is the lifeblood of every follower of Jesus. It is what should drive us. Now, here's a good question. What does the love of God look like? I have one word for you. And it rhymes with please us. Jesus, very good. What does the love of God look like? It looks like Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of the love of God. The love of God is ultimately revealed in its fullest form in and through the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Look at the beautiful life of Jesus. He showed us what it looked like, what God desires humans to be like towards one another. Right? He showed us a beautiful humanity, Jesus did with his life, the way that he loved people, not just people who were for him and supported him, but the way he loved people who were even against him, the way that he loved people who even crucified him, began to murder him. Like he even loved his enemies and offered forgiveness even to them. And what does ultimately that lead to? Life to the full, Right? We see love embodied through the life of Jesus. And then in the death of Jesus, in him giving himself so that humans who are broken could be put back together, could be forgiven and set free. This is how Jesus operated in his life, even in his death, reveals the fullness of the love of God. Also in his life, the way he stood for people who were oppressed Jesus raised the floor for every group of people, bringing dignity and value to those who didn't have it before. Man, Jesus brought life to people. This is the love of God revealed in Jesus. And because of what Jesus has done, as we talked about our definition of the gospel, the power of sin and death doesn't have the last word over us. Jesus has conquered sin and death which means that Jesus has the last word over us. And what does Jesus' word over you say? It says that you are beloved, that you belong, that you are accepted, that you are forgiven, that you are free, and he even calls us friend. This is his word over us. This is the love of God. Jesus, his love is self-giving, co-suffering, radically forgiving, and it's always present. That is the love of God. And when 1 John 4, 16 tells us this, that God is love, God is love, what does God's love look like? What I just described. It's Jesus himself. It's more than blowing kisses, right? It's more than standing around a fire and singing songs and feeling warm, although that's great. It's not sappy or syrupy. This love is real, it's raw, it's gritty, it's present, it gets in the muck and the mire, and it's with you. Jesus is ascribed a title that we don't talk about a lot, usually just during Christmas. He's ascribed the title of Emmanuel, which means what? God with us, God with us, God with us. Jesus is what God looks like. Jesus is what God's love looks like. And what he shows us is the love that he gives us. It's not just for people who like me. It's for people who don't like me. And I've got to express it the way that Jesus expressed it. For people who have different thoughts than me, that act differently than me, that look differently than me, that belong even to different religions than I belong to, I am to love those people the way that Jesus loved me. Right? This is the type of fruit love is, right? And if I'm not loving others that way, then I'm not rooted in the right soil. And as followers of Jesus, we cannot go any further than here. If we are not loving people the way Jesus has loved us, then something needs to change. Because as followers of Jesus, love must be growing off of our lives. Because the essence of Christianity is love. It's love. 
the one thing Jesus told us to do. One, I say it every week. John 13, 34, a new command I give you. Love what? One another. How do we love one another? In the way that I have loved you, so you must love one another. If we aren't loving well, we're not doing Christianity because the essence and the heart of Christianity is founded in the love of God, revealed and expressed through Jesus, his son. If we're not loving people, we're rooted in the wrong soil and we're believing something else is a better way and that's called idolatry. And idolatry leads us into sin, which opens us up to our sinful nature that we read about and it pulls us in a direction far from God. So we need to come back to love, to the love of Jesus, and ask yourself, is that kind of love growing off of my life? Am I loving people the way Jesus has loved me? Love is the first fruit. The second fruit today is joy. Joy. Joy is a fruit that grows off of the life of a person that has Jesus at the center and has surrendered or submitted to or yielded to the Spirit's leading in our lives. Joy. I want to say this about joy. We mentioned it last week. I'll mention it again. Joy is different than happiness. Happiness is based on circumstance, right? It's circumstantial. But here's what I know about happiness and, and circumstances. Our circumstances change all the time, right? Every single day, sometimes every hour, based on what happens or the phone call we get or who walks into our door, right? Our happiness can change, right? As our circumstances change every single day. And if we're looking to happiness to be the thing that brings us life, you're going to live life on an emotional roller coaster every day. Because how many of you would confess our days go like this over and over and over and over again? And so happiness cannot be the goal. There's nothing wrong with being happy. But happiness cannot be the goal because it's circumstantial and circumstances change. But joy is different. Joy isn't determined by what's happening outside of me, but joy is determined by what's happening inside of me. It's not based on my outer circumstances, but my inward trust in Christ. And if I trust Christ, then no matter what's going on outside, there is a joy that can grow off of me on the inside. So that means this, joy can be present in dark situations. Joy can come out of us even in moments of grief and brokenness and suffering because joy isn't dependent on what's happening out here but what's happening in here. And, and, and I truly believe this, that as followers of Jesus, we should be the most joyful people on the planet. Not that our lives go well all the time because they don't, but because we have a trust in a God that never wavers that brings us life and hope no matter what we face. And we can have joy because of that. Nehemiah said to God's people in chapter eight, verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your what? Your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You wanna know how to be strong in difficult circumstances? Have the joy of the Lord, it's your strength. And it tells me this, when we don't have joy, we don't have strength, which makes us what? Weak, right? We're weak. We need joy. The amount of joy that you and I have is directly proportional to the amount of strength that you have. Joy and strength go together. They go together. And we need joy. How do we get joy? Smile more? That's a good idea. You should do that anyway. Work on your laugh. Develop a heartier laugh. No, remember, here's what I want to remind you of. This is not a to-do list. It's a results list. If you want more joy, trust in Christ. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and the result will be joy will naturally begin to come to you because the Spirit develops joy inside of you. Look at Jesus. Think about Jesus and joy. Hebrews 12, 2, a shocking verse to me. It says this, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's not the shocking part. This one is. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Jesus considered the cross to be joy. That's bonkers to me. Because if you understand first century culture and you look at the Roman Empire, crucifixion was not a joyful thing. 
It was a shameful. On the outside, looking at the outside, it was a very shameful thing. You know who crucifixions were reserved for? Rebels that rebelled against the Roman Empire. And what they wanted to do was squash any rebellion that came up against the Roman Empire. And what they would do, they would strip people naked, they would hang them on a cross, and they would bludgeon them and beat them until they died. And then they would leave them on the road, stick the cross in the ground on the road at eye level. So people who were thinking about rebelling against Rome would see dead bodies hanging on crosses and say, that's not going to be me, I'm not going to rebel against them. That's what crucifixion was for in the first century. It was not pretty. It was one of the most shameful things that you could even talk about in your homes. On the outside, it was ugly. But Jesus, it says, for the joy set before him endured the cross. What does that say? It says this. Joy doesn't have to be based on the circumstances that we're facing. Joy isn't determined by what's happening on the outside, but rather by who I'm trusting on the inside. So joy can be present no matter what we face in life. It's not about what's happening to me, but rather what's happening in me. This is joy. Jesus considered the cross to be joy because he had a trust in God and followed the leading of the Spirit. So I want to, to ask you this question, is, is this present in your life? Is there joy coming out of your life? Not happiness because you got to raise, but a deep joy that's present even when things are difficult. Third fruit, last one we'll cover for today, is peace. Love, joy, last one is peace. Life is full of things that stress us out, that make us weary, that make us worry, and that overwhelm and overtake us. Life is full of that, and we all know that because we live life. Life is difficult. In John 14, as we talk about peace, here, here we again, we learn from the import, about the importance of the Holy Spirit from Jesus. He says this in John 14, I have said these things to you while I am still with you, indicating he's not gonna be with them much longer. I've said these things to you, this is Jesus talking, while I am still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, through whom the Father will send in my name, Listen to the Holy Spirit's job. We'll teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. So when I'm gone, I'm sending somebody that's going to remind you and teach you about everything that's going to lead you and guide you in the way that Jesus has shown us. In verse 27, he says this, peace I leave with you and my peace I give to you. And I love this. I do not give this peace as the world gives. So don't let your hearts be troubled and don't let them be afraid because we can have the peace that Jesus offers. Two things about the peace of Jesus that I would like to bring up. First is this, Jesus doesn't give peace the way that the world gives peace. Let me ask this question, how does the world achieve peace? Think about the Roman Empire, how did they achieve peace? Right, they would threaten you. They would bully you. They would go to war and kill you, right? Because if we get our way, then that's true peace. And if you're standing in our way, we'll mow over you so that we can have peace, right? The way that the world operates to get peace is war. But Jesus says, I don't give peace that way because that's not true peace, right? True peace doesn't eliminate enemies by killing them. True peace eliminates enemies by forgiving them and by laying down your life for them. This is the way of Jesus. It's a difficult way, but he shows us a better way, and he shows us a way to true peace. It's not by taking. It's by giving, right? That's how the kingdom of the world operates, and Jesus shows us the way that the kingdom of God operates, right? His peace isn't dependent on the affairs of the world. All you know what can be breaking loose in the world, and it doesn't have to shake the peace that we have, right? Because our peace in Christ doesn't depend on if the world is at peace or not. We can be at peace in troubled times because Jesus is Lord. He is. In John 16, he would go on to make this statement. 
in this world, you will have many troubles, trials, problems. Like this, this life is hard. There's gonna be a lot in the way. You'll have many troubles, but he says, take heart, be encouraged, be of peace, Jesus says, because I have overcome the world. I have shown you a better way, right? How do we have peace? Trust Christ, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and peace begins to grow in side of us. That's true peace. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. Like Peace is something we are called to. It's something we are called to be. It's not something we can just conjure up on our own at first. It's something the Spirit grows inside of us as we trust in Christ and follow the way of Christ. We just don't have inner peace and tranquility. We are also to be peacemakers that when there's conflict, we don't run from it, we run to it. With the goal, not of being right, but of getting it right, right? We are to be peacemakers. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In other words, when you're worried and anxious, trust God first. And when you put your trust in him and follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, it says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's true peace. So I want to say true peace is not the absence of conflict, but rather a trust in the presence of Christ. That's true peace. And if your peace is founded in the presence of Jesus that no matter what happens on the outside, you can always be at peace. Not that you're not comfortable with things that are going on around you, of course you're not. But we can move forward and have life even in the midst of uncomfortable situations because we are grounded in Christ and we follow the leading of the Spirit. I want you to know, God has made you to have peace. He's called you to peace. And Jesus is always giving peace because he's the owner of peace. He is the prince of peace. And he's always giving peace. And I think for us, sometimes the problem is we just don't trust him enough. It's Jesus, yes, I trust you, but I'm gonna go over here and trust this too. It's Jesus plus something else. But I wanna say today, Jesus plus nothing is everything that you need. Everything. Trust in Christ, with all the stress and worry and anxiety that goes on inside of us, Jesus encourages us that we don't have to be overtaken by it because he has already overcome the world. And so we need to trust him. What does it look like to trust Jesus? No matter what's going on, I'm going to follow the way of Jesus because that's where our peace and our hope and our joy and our love and our life is found in following the way of Jesus. And as we follow that way, the Spirit begins to develop and grow in our lives these incredible fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, and on and on and on and on. So I want to ask you, are these fruits growing in your life? Do you have joy? Do you have peace? Is love growing off of your life? The love of Jesus, is it growing? Ask yourself, What's growing off the tree of my life? What's really growing there? Is it the acts of the sinful nature that we read about? Are those things driving us and controlling us? Or is it the voice, the guidance of the Spirit? Is that guiding us and leading us? And remember, this is not about us trying harder, trying to conjure up these things, right? It's not about trying harder. It's not a to-do list. It's a results list. We cannot produce the love of God on our own, right? The same way that a pine tree can't produce apples, right? It just doesn't happen. It's not our job to do that. These are the fruits of the Spirit. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to grow these in us. Our only job is to get connected to the Spirit, to trust the Spirit's guiding, to follow the teachings and the way of Jesus. And as we do, what you're going to find is that these fruits begin to grow off of your life. And the beauty of a fruit tree is this, is the fruit tree just doesn't enjoy the fruit for itself, right? It's for other people to come and experience that. And so if we want our friends and our family and our coworkers and our community and the people to truly experience the love of Jesus and the life that he offers, 
It's only going to happen when we, the followers of Jesus, get yielded and submitted to the Holy Spirit and follow the way of Jesus that he leads us on. And naturally then, the Spirit will begin to grow and develop a love like you've never experienced. Patience with people. You'll be kind towards people. This is what the Spirit grows. And I want to ask, are these fruits in your life? If not, you're not in trouble. You're not going to get sent to the principal's office. We're not going to kick you out. The good news is this, is today is an opportunity for us to repent. And repent is a good word. It just means to turn to a better way. The day we recognize we followed the wrong way, we're going to turn back and follow a better way. That's the way of Jesus, trusting Christ. Today, what if a fresh start was simply trusting Jesus where you are, with what you're walking with? What if you just trusted him?